Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. Each and every morning, I hope you'll bring uh, an app or your physical Bible with you, your journal. Because we're going to begin, as we've done, with worship and drawing our attention to who God is and who we are in His presence. And then we're going to open the Word of God and we're going to set the theme for each and every day. Last night, our theme was follow. And Jasper talked to us about his personal journey, which many of us could relate to. A period of time where God began to move on us and around us, and we were aware of his presence. This morning, we begin the the theme for the day of see, to see Jesus. But I want you to notice the progression. If you miss the progression, you may miss the importance of what it means to see Jesus. For many of us, to see Jesus means to become aware of him for the first time. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. We've already made the choice to follow him, So how do we see him once we've begun to follow him? You'll have relationships for the rest of your life that will change each and every day. When and if each of you marry, you're going to find that the person you marry doesn't stay the same person they were when you met them at 18 or 20 or 25. That as their life grows and they experience more things, each of us changes. But what's interesting about the Bible is it says God never changes. He's the same today, he'll be the same tomorrow as he was yesterday. He is faithful, he is true, he is good. There's no room for improvement in God, nor is there room for improvement in Jesus. As we begin to follow Jesus, if we pay close attention, he will reveal himself more and more every day. He's too big, he's too vast, he's too powerful to understand in the first glimpse. So please, every single one of us, Don't think for a moment you truly know Jesus. But do think for a moment that you can know him more. That you can grow and understand by reading the word of God, by living in Christian community, by opening ourselves up to truth. We can see Jesus for who he is, but also be very, very careful. When you see Jesus for who he is, it'll change who you are. You won't won't be satisfied with what you are. The best thing about Jesus is he makes you want to change, but he doesn't change you. He makes you want to be different. He makes you want to love more. He makes you want to accept grace. He makes you, when you understand who he is, open yourselves up to all he is. So don't don't put him in a box. Don't paint a picture of him. Don't, Don't hold him to the Jesus you learned about when you were six years old. In Sunday school lessons that are good, but incomplete. We want to see Jesus? Let's look at how Peter saw him after he'd already followed him. Verse 22 of Matthew chapter 14. And all we're going to do this morning is walk this very simple text. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. We'll pause the story here for a moment. Jesus had just fed the 5,000. He took a little boy's sack lunch of a couple of biscuits and some fish, and he fed 5,000 men and their families on a hillside. And when it was done, there were 12 baskets of food remaining. And the crowd began to want this Jesus. They, they wanted him for who they thought he was. They were going to make him king. And the Bible clearly points this out. All, all Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John keep reminding us is the crowd didn't know who Jesus was completely, so they wanted to make him what they wanted him to become. And Jesus won't let you make him what you want him to be. He will only reveal who he already is. And so the crowd was wanting to make Jesus king. Now, you might look at that and go, why is that a bad deal? Well, go back to Matthew chapter 4, when Satan took Jesus and tempted him in the wilderness after he'd fasted for 40 days. Satan came to him, and one of the things Satan offered him was, I can make you king now. I can give you the kingdom and have the entire world bow to you. Because Satan knew that if he could get Jesus to do what the world wanted him to do, then Jesus would never be able to do what God wanted him to do. If Jesus had bowed to the now instead of the new, he would have been king, and he would have been good at it. And we would all die, miserable, without any hope, and no way to overcome ourselves. But when they tried to push him toward this, Jesus knew something. He knew that if they pushed him toward that, 
that the world would grab him. And even there are moments you'll see when you read the story of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see there are moments his mom tried him to go faster than God, his brothers tried to get him to go faster than God, and even Peter tries to get him to go faster than God's timing. So Jesus says, I won't have any of this. He knew what the crowd was capable of. So what he did was he put his disciples in a boat and he sent them across and he said, go to the other side and I'll meet you there. And Mark records it was the only boat there. I want you to pay attention to the details because if you pay attention to the details, things get revealed. So they take the boat. Twelve of them get in it and they start across the Sea of Galilee. Verse 23, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, which tells you he'd been there a long time, they, were, they went out at probably sundown, and when evening came, in the dark of the night, he was still up there. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the winds because, or the waves rather, because the wind was against it. I want you to notice what Jesus did. When the crowd wanted him to do more than God asked him to do, when the crowd wanted to expedite the time frame that God had intended, Jesus put the disciples away from the crowd, he dismissed the crowd, and he went up and spent time in prayer with his Father. If you notice when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the books in your Bible, when you read those stories, you're going to notice that if there ever was a great moment in Jesus' ministry, it was always, capital A, it was always preceded by a time alone with God in prayer. Here's what I believe. I believe Jesus would have made great decisions. I believe Jesus was a very wise man. I believe he was spirit-led. The Bible tells me that. But he also knew that his role on earth was to submit himself to his Father, to not make a choice for himself. He never made a choice of what was good for him. He always made a choice of what was good from the Father. And he went to the mountain and he prayed. He got away from the crowd. He got away from the demands. I believe Jesus was tempted by the desire to do away with the cross so he could have all the glory now. But instead of focusing on the now, Jesus chose the new. And I'm going to tell every single one of us, every day of our lives as disciples of Jesus, when we see him for who he is, his example should be our example. We should wait on God to deliver us, for God to instruct us, for God to guide us, rather than grabbing what the world says we ought to do. And Jesus comes down from the mountain because a storm came up. Verse 25, during the fourth watch of the night, which is according to the way they kept time, this would have been 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. Now, I want a pause for a moment. These are fishermen for the majority. At least a third of the 12 men in that boat are on the water regularly, and people use the water regularly. So it wouldn't be like a city people who don't go to the lake very often. They were in a boat. They knew how to navigate the waters. They knew the Sea of Galilee. It's about 16 miles long, and it's about eight and a half miles wide. To call it a sea is kind of awkward. It's more like a, a lake. It has it, no comparison to the Great Lakes that you are surrounded by up here in Michigan. But it's this little tiny lake or a long lake, and they've navigated it over and over. So there's not a lot of surprises on it. But they have been on the lake over six hours. And the wind is so strong and the waves are so high that these experienced fishermen are exhausted. Mark tells us in his story, when he records this story, he tells us they were tormented by the waves. They'd lost hope. They thought, so this is where I die? And Jesus walks by or comes to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him, they were terrified. Duh. I want you to think about that. You've been doing it for six or eight hours. You know if you quit, it's the end of your life, and all of a sudden you look, and there's someone walking on the water, and they record, it's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Let's pause the story here for just a heartbeat. I've given you a lot of details so that we can sink the hook in a little bit deeper on what's taking place. Let's see if you paid attention. Who put him in the boat? Come on, church. You know that there's always five answers that answers any question a preacher asks, right? God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, baptism, and Bible. Answer one of those. You're probably right. We'll try again. Who put him in the boat? Jesus did. He did it intentionally, right? I've already established that. He sent them into a storm. Here's what I want you to know. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, sometimes he puts you in a storm to gather your attention. 
Now, you live in a world that says if God really loves you, he's going to make your life comfortable, easy, smooth, there'll be no problems. I'm going to tell you, uh uh-uh. If you really want to follow Jesus, there's going to be times you're hungry, times you're thirsty, sometimes you're lonely, sometimes you're broken, sometimes you're scared, sometimes you're threatened, and sometimes you have to choose between life and death. You can go to the largest church in the United States. That preacher will tell you that God wants you to be rich and healthy and happy all the time. And if you're not those things, it's your fault. And I'm going to tell you this. Jesus put the disciples in a boat. He sent them across the water into the eye of a storm so that he could reveal who he was. Pay attention to your circumstances and you may see Jesus. He photobombs every moment of your life. I want you to think about this. He is a photobombing ninja. You may not see him in the original picture. But if you'll pull that picture out with a little bit of time and a little bit of faith, you'll see he was there all along. Jesus says, take courage. Now, Jesus isn't one of those people that asks you to do something you can't do. He's also not one of those people who gives you a ridiculous chore. When Jesus tells you to take courage, it's because you need courage. And what is courage? Courage is being scared and facing it anyway. When the Bible says, do not fear, it's because there's a reason to fear. I remember my dad was a little, when I was a little person, my dad would get on me and I would cry and he would say, stop your crying, like that worked. Oh yes, thank you sir, I'm done. It just made me cry harder. He's like, dry up, it doesn't help. When Jesus said to them, take courage, here's how we take courage. The next thing he says, it is I. The reason I can have courage in the midst of any storm I face is because Jesus said, you're not alone. I'm there with you. I'm going to walk through this with you. Don't be afraid. Choose not to fear when Jesus is right there. But for many of us, we panic and we bolt and we fail because we can't imagine that the God of the universe has time for our petty problems, so we take it upon ourselves. And the disciples in the boat couldn't row. They couldn't move the boat. They were fighting the fear. They were terrified by the fact that this is how they were going to die. And Jesus said, it's not your circumstances that are in charge. I'm in charge. And by the way, look, I'm walking on the waves that scare you. There are multiple things in my life that I can't handle. But there is nothing in my life Jesus can't handle. And if I'm following him, and I'm in proximity to the creator of the universe, what wave is going to wipe him out? What storm is going to sink him? What threat is going to actually threaten him? None. He says, don't don't be afraid. It's me. Verse 28 makes me happy. If I had a tail, it'd be wagging right now, because this is what Peter says. Peter's the only one on the boat who's, they're all freaked out. They think it's a ghost. Jesus, well, Mark tells us something. I think it's funny. No one ever laughs when I tell this part of it. Mark, in his rendition of the story, says, Jesus was going to walk by the boat to the other side to wait for them. And then they were like, Lord! Which is kind of funny. Jesus is like, oh, there you are. No, he knew exactly where they were. But here's what I want you to notice. Whenever you cry out to Jesus, he will answer. They cried out in terror, and he said, don't be afraid. I'm right here. I've got this. You don't. I've got this. And Peter, verse 28, Lord, if it's you, that's a real bad translation in the New International Version. Some of you have a different translation. The actual Greek translated the way he would have said it, said, Lord, it's you. Tell me to come to you on the water. This is an amazing moment in Peter's life. Because he sees who Jesus is in the midst of a storm that frightened him, he has the courage to say, I just don't want you to rescue me. I want to experience you. He said, it's you. Can I come? And Jesus responds with one simple word. Come. Do you see Jesus there? Notice it. Jesus isn't like, mind your business, Peter. Play your role. He's like, no, no, no. Come. Peter got out of the boat. Boy, let, pardon the pun, let that sink in. He got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, I don't know why I find that comical, but I've never seen the wind. I've seen the effects of the wind, but I've never seen the wind. Peter saw the waves, and he felt the wind. And in the moment of following Jesus, he doubted. He became afraid. He was pursuing Jesus, but 
he wasn't Jesus. And in that moment, Peter began to rely on his strength rather than the presence that called him out. Remember, this is the same guy who saw Jesus and said, dude, it's you. And Jesus is like, it's me. And he said, can I do that? And Jesus said, come. And he started doing it. We don't know how far he walked. He may have got two feet. He may have got 30 yards. But he got a, a distance away from the safety of the boat. That when the waves and the wind started hitting him, this is what Peter thought. I can't do this. And he was absolutely right. And down he went in the water. It was when he saw Jesus and saw that Jesus could do it, he lost his fear and he gained courage and he began to walk on water. And he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Peter never forgot who Jesus was, even in the midst of this. Immediately, I love that, Jesus didn't go, well, you need to learn a lesson. <laughs> Which I probably as a dad would have gone, oh, 30 seconds underwater, never hurt anybody. It says, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand. He was so close. Think about that. He was so close to Jesus, but he became panicked by what he couldn't do rather than who he was with. He reached down his hand and he caught him. You of little faith. And here's what I want to embed in your minds today. How you hear Jesus say that is what you truly feel about Jesus. When you hear the words of Jesus, you will interpret it by the way you perceive him. If you have a Jesus who's always disgusted with you, if you have a Jesus who says, really, dude, it's about the 13th time you've said you're sorry for the same thing, then you're going to hear Jesus say, oh, you have a little faith. But if you see Jesus for who the Bible reveals him to be, the same Jesus who will reach in the water and pull you out and set you in the boat, you'll hear Jesus say this, oh, you had faith. It was little, but you had faith. You trusted me. You know, the truth of the matter is, there's only two people who've ever walked on water. One forever, and one for just a few moments. And Jesus said, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And that's not an indictment. He's not saying, why'd you doubt? He said to him, Peter, you were walking on water. You saw me. You were experiencing what faith can do for you. You had that experience. And then the word doubt. Jesus uses a distinct word. Here's the word picture. While Peter was walking on water, he wanted to get to Jesus, but he wanted to stay dry. He wanted to keep a foot in the boat. When he saw the wind and he saw the waves, he wished he were back in the boat because it was scary to walk by faith. And Jesus said, Peter, why did you want to go back to the boat when you were walking on the water? I want to tell you this simple truth. It's the core of this story. If you're going to follow Jesus by faith, you're going to get soaking wet. If you want to stay dry, stay in the boat. It's no fun being dry. It's a whole lot more fun walking on water. But when you walk on water, Jesus never promises you won't get wet, that the wind and the waves won't threaten you. He never promises that he's going to put you in a situation where you're always safe and everything's comfortable. And No, no, Jesus said, if you follow me, I'm going to take you to your death. But in your death, you're going to find life. You see, there's a lot of truth here, and here's where I want to end it for you. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, verse 32. Immediately, Jesus is the man, if you haven't heard this before. He gets in the boat, and the storm stops. The disciples had been in a boat with him before, remember? He fell asleep in it while a storm raged, and they woke him up and asked the bad question, do you not care if we die? And Jesus said, peace be still, and immediately the waves stopped. They didn't stop eventually, they stopped immediately. And what Matthew records here is the moment Jesus stepped into the boat, the wind died down. But listen, if walking on water was the end game, then you and I would be like, ah, we're not there. Here's what I want you to notice, verse 33. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Matthew doesn't record this, so you and I can imagine one day we walk on water. What he says is, in the storm, when Jesus reveals who he is, you'll know he's the Son of God. And when we get who Jesus is, then we understand who we are. And this message is for followers. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to ask you a question to ponder today. Why not? You'll never meet anyone as powerful, as good, as loving, and as forgiving as Jesus. No one. The world can't offer you what he offers you. So follow him. And the only way you learn how to follow Jesus is by following Jesus. 
listening to his words and trusting them. And for those of us that are followers of Jesus, pay attention. Every day, in a storm, he's teaching you a lesson, who he is. So that at the end of all of these storms, we ask ourselves this. Is he the son of God? Can I trust him? Is he good? Just a few moments, we're going to be dismissed. And you're going to have an opportunity to go with your, your groups. And the easy thing for us to do is turn this off and just start yapping, going up the steps and, and carrying on. I, I want to challenge you to try something this morning. If you're really interested in seeing who Jesus is, prepare your hearts and mind because you're going to break out into your groups. And before you get to your small groups, you're going to have encounter time, a time to sit with your Bible and look at this particular teaching. Or maybe you have a personal Bible study you're going through that I'm going to encourage you to open your Bibles and spend time in that. You're going to get a few moments and then your small group leaders are going to draw you back into big group. Do not waste this encounter time with Jesus. If we see him for who he is, it'll show us who we are and it'll change us. If we follow him and we pay attention. For those of you that are graduating seniors, I just want you very quietly to look at your small group leaders, your your youth ministers, and they're going to tell you, yeah, you're coming down front and to sit for a few minutes while the room clears, or they may say that you're going with your church groups, and either one of those are great options. But if you're going to be in the next level, I just want you to come down and sit down here in the front, and then after the room's clear, we'll give instructions. Very quietly, let's go spend some time with Jesus. You are dismissed.